Okay, so um, yeah, so if you consider collisions uh, between binomial coefficients that are adjacent like this, then after clearing denominators, you get uh, this equation, um, which is a quadratic equation. Uh, so this is basically the only uh, type of collision basically that gives you a quadratic equation. Um, and we know how to solve quadratic equations. We can diagonalize this, and then uh, you, you find that you get um, something squared minus five times something else squared equals minus four. Um, and this is an example of what's called Pell's equation, uh, which has been, uh, we've known how to solve since I think the ancient Greeks. Um, and um, uh, well, uh, some examples at least. Um, and so there's a, there's a specific family of solutions here. Uh, in fact, uh, N and M, uh, there's an infinite family of solutions um, given by Fibonacci numbers, um, products of Fibonacci numbers, as it turns out. Um, and so this was worked out by Lin, Singh, Master, and Tovey. Um, so this 3003 that you saw is actually the first member of an infinite family of collisions. 13 choose five equals 14 choose six. Um, and then the, um, there's a bunch more, this infinite family of binomial collisions, uh, which actually um, they grow quite fast, double exponentially, in fact, um, but there's still an infinite family. Okay, so there are some, um, so even after restricting to the left half of Pascal's triangle, there's still some collisions. There's this infinite family. Um, so um, in addition to this infinite family, there are some sporadic collisions. Uh, so we already saw that 120 appears twice, uh, 16 choose two and 10 choose three. And in fact, there are seven um, collisions that are not explained by uh, this, um, this infinite family. Uh, and they're listed here. They're all fairly small examples of, um, of collision. In fact, 3003 appears both as the first member of this infinite family of collisions. And, but additionally is also, um, this number also can be, has a collision with a, a third binomial coefficient, 78 choose two. Okay, so we have these seven sporadic collisions and one infinite um, family of collisions. And uh, it was conjectured by De Vega in the 90s that these are the only collisions that remain. So once you restrict to the left half of Pascal's triangle, um, you only have this infinite family of collisions discovered by Lin, Sin, Master, and Tovey, uh, and then these seven sporadic collisions. And we, um, and it is conjectured that there are no further collisions in uh, Pascal's triangle. Um, intuitively, the reason for this is that the, uh, the entries in this triangle tend to grow exponentially fast. Um, so if you look at, at um, you know, the, the first n rows of Pascal's triangle, there's only like n squared entries and that they tend to be of exponential size. Just from probabilistic heuristics, we don't expect too many collisions. Um, so, um, and so these are the only ones that we found and we don't believe there's any more. Um, this conjecture implies Singh Master's conjecture. Uh, if this conjecture is true, then it implies, in fact, that any um, number appears at most six times uh, in Pascal's triangle, uh, any number bigger than one. So that's a typo, not, not bigger than two, um, except for 3003, which is the only number that appears actually eight times. Um, so the, uh, yeah, we've, we've never found any other number that appears eight or more times in Pascal's triangle. And we believe this is, uh, the, the conjecture is that this is, uh, this is the maximum multiplicity. Um, in Pascal's triangle. Okay, so that is the conjecture. Uh, so what is known? Um, so this conjecture uh, has been verified numerically. Um, so up to, uh, if, you, if you take the first million rows or if you take all the, um, uh, all the entries up to 10 to the 60, um, there are no, uh, there's no other collisions known uh, or found other than the ones that we've, we've already uh, listed. Um, there's no collisions n choose m equals n choose m prime if n, m, and m prime are the same. Uh, that, that's easy because um, uh, um, when you, once you fix m, n choose m is increasing, an increasing function of m. Um, and then for small n and m, if you look at the equation n choose m equals n prime choose n prime, that's uh, for fixed m and, uh, m and m prime, that is some, uh, just a fixed Diophantine equation. You know, so for example, um, n choose two, equals n prime choose three, that's actually the equation of some elliptic curve. Um, and you can, um, and we can actually count how many solutions there are. And so for very small values of m and n prime, uh, you have some low degree curve and um, we, uh, there are various techniques to actually solve, uh, to complete the integer points on these curves. Um, and uh, so we know that this conjecture is true for small values of m and n prime. Uh, and in fact, for any fixed m and n prime, um, which are not equal, there's only a finite number of solutions uh, thanks to a famous theorem of Siegel on integral points, so any curve of positive genus actually. Um, uh, um, uh, can only have finitely many integer points. 
And so in fact, um, um, as long as n and n prime are large enough, um, you will outrun all the solutions. And so, uh, yeah, so for m and n prime really, really small compared to n and n prime, um, there, are, um, there will be no solutions other than the ones that uh, um, are in de Vegas conjecture. Um, now, famously, Siegel's theorem is ineffective. It doesn't actually tell you, um, it, it tells you there's finitely many um, integer points. Um, by the way, uh, there's some audio interference. Uh, I don't know if uh, people can mute themselves. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, the theorem is ineffective. It doesn't give any bounds on where the, the integer points are. So, this, so uh, we know that uh, if m and n prime is small enough, uh, there's, no, there's no extra solutions, but we, we, um, uh, we don't have... Um, uh, okay, we don't have an effective bound on this. No. Okay. It's pretty good. Is it okay? Okay. Uh, ben, can you mute yourself, please? Okay, thanks. All right. Um, all right. Um, and there's a few other examples. Yeah. Uh, the same sort of arguments also show that um, the Vegas and is true for N and M. Um, uh, there are no collisions that are really, really close to each other other than um, this infinite family. So this, there's this infinite family of solutions. Um, where n and m are just um, n prime n prime is n minus one n plus one, and there's a few other um, uh, examples like that for which you can classify solutions. Um, so th there is some uh, uh, yeah. So you kind of solutions that are really really close together, and you kind of solutions that are really really close to the edge of, of the uh, collisions that are really really close to the edge of the triangle. Okay. Um, now people have also counted um, can try to, to bound how many solutions. Um, there are. So Singmaster's conjecture says that for a fixed T, uh, there's only a bounded number of solutions. Um, but uh, that's not proven, but there are some upper bounds. Um, so a very simple upper bound is that once you're in the left half of the triangle, once M is small, um, if you want to solve the equation T equals N choose M, well, N is at least 2M. So um, uh, N choose M is at least 2M choose M. And Sterling's formula tells you that 2M choose M um, goes exponentially in M, it's basically four to the M. Um, so uh, you can use this, it gives you an upper bound for any fixed T, uh, M actually cannot grow much faster, it cannot be much bigger than log T. Um, and here I use the usual notation log sub two T is log log T, and I also will, there'll be a log three T that shows up briefly. Um, so once you fix T, um, there's only uh, log T many choices for M. And once you fix M, um, and t, uh, that determines n, because this is an increasing function of n. So uh, the total number of solutions to this equation for any fixed t is at most log t. Uh, so there's not that many solutions um, for any fixed t, um, but this isn't bounded, this still grows. Um, now, this bound of log t is very simple, uh, but it's actually quite hard to improve. It's been improved a little bit. Um, so very slowly over time, uh, this log t bound has been improved. Um, so first Abbott, Furnish, and Hansen gained a log log t. Um, and, then, uh, and then 30 years later, um, Kane basically uh, gained another factor of log log t, uh, losing a log 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 t. Uh, and then finally, um, Kane gained a third factor of, of uh, sorry, this, this should be a log cubed of log 2t, that's a typo. Um, gained um, three factors of log, uh, log log t on the bottom. Okay, um, and that's actually still the best known bound. Um, you can do somewhat better, you can get like log to the two thirds of t uh, if you assume uh, Kramer's conjecture on the gaps between primes, um, but that is an unproven conjecture that's very difficult. Okay, so uh, there hasn't been much progress on upper bounds for the whole triangle. Uh, so what we were able to do this year uh, was we were able to show um, at least in the middle of the triangle, uh, things are really good. Uh, so what we showed is that in, if you look at, um, if you don't make m bigger than two, but you make m a little bit bigger than two, bigger than uh, this quantity, exponential of log two thirds plus epsilon, which is just a quantity which goes a bit faster than log n, but sm slower than say n to the epsilon. Uh, so it's, it's, it's some sort of quasi-logarithmic um, growth here. In this region, um, actually, there's only two solutions at most. Okay, so if you, have, if you take Pascal's triangle, so uh, we want a bounded number of solutions. And so uh, what, uh, what this theme says is that in a region like this, there's at most two solutions. 
okay, to this equation and choose m equals t. Um, and then of course by symmetry, uh, you get the same thing over on the other side. So in a big interior region of Haskell's triangle, we can verify sigma master's conjecture, but at the edge, uh, we can't say very much. Um, okay, but that's the only remaining case. So if you want to prove sigma master's conjecture, you, have to, you can restrict the case where m is much smaller than n. Okay, so this is our, uh, our main theorem. Um, okay, uh, and this bound of two is completely sharp because we have this infinite family of collisions uh, in this region. Um, so we can get two solutions, but we can't have three, three solutions. Um, we also have a variant. Uh, if you also place a slight upper bound, um, if you improve the upper bound on M, then you, actually, you only get one solution. So again, um, in a region like this, there are two solutions, but then there's a, there's a uh, there's a region like this where there's only one solution. Okay. Um, so we can get actually quite good bounds in, in the interior region, but um, our methods are, are restricted to the interior. We can't really say very much uh, on the edge. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, the way we approach this problem is that we, we, we combine two sort of orthogonal methods, uh, which we call the Archimedean approach and the non-Archimedean approach. Um, so the Archimedean approach, the idea is that you, you're solving this equation in integers, right? You're trying to find integer, integer solutions to n choose m equals t. And uh, the Archimedean approach says, okay, we're gonna try to um, suppress the fact that n of them are integers and just think of them actually as real numbers. And uh, instead of factorials, you use gamma functions and use methods from real complex analysis to, tr to try to control solutions um, using uh, yeah, the, real, the real embedding. Um, and then there's the um, complementary non-Archimedean approach where we don't view these numbers as real numbers, but instead we basically view them as p-adic numbers. Uh, and we, we instead of um, trying to understand the, the real magnitude of, of, of be real behavior of, of this equation, we, we study things like, uh, we take p-valuations of both sides. We ask how many times does p divide both sides of this equation? Um, and so it's a, by a combination of, of these two techniques that you could get, uh, we can get our theorem. Um, now, potentially, uh, we could maybe combine these two in some sort of some grand unified adelic um, approach, but there doesn't seem to be any uh, great advantage, to, uh, at least we couldn't find one to doing so. All right, so let's first describe the Archimedean approach. So uh, this is an approach that basically um, we, we got from the earlier work of Kane, which uh, who bounded, uh, uh, who found upper bounds for number of solutions. Um, for num uh, adding number theorists may also recognize that this method is very similar in spirit to what's called the Bombier Peeler determinant method, which I won't discuss further here. Okay, so we wanna solve this equation n choose m equals t. So we think of n and m now as, as being real numbers and we replace n factorial by gamma of n plus one and so uh, we instead study this equation. Uh, um, so this is a, a, um, a generalization of this binomial equation to real N and M's. If you like, we're taking Pascal's triangle and we're interpolating it um, to, to, to a continuous um, function. Now, it turns out that uh, when you fix M and T, uh, this left-hand side is increasing in N. So, um, there's, in fact, there's, so there's exactly one solution N to this equation for every M and T. So you can find uh, there's a function f sub t of m, which is the unique n that solves this equation. It's usually real. It's it's not not integer, um, but for every m and t, there is some real number, a unique real number f t of m that solves this equation. Um, and uh, from the inverse function theorem, it turns out this is a nice smooth function. In fact, it's even analytic. Um, and the problem of solving this um, this um, Diophantian equation is um, equivalent to counting lattice points on a certain curve. So if you, if you graph this curve, um, uh, it's some analytic um, curve uh, and uh, we will restrict M to be between N and two and N over two. So that gives you some restrictions on M. And so there's basically um, some curve. All right, so, so basically if you wanna find collisions to uh, Pascal's triangle, you're basically trying to find how many points on a certain curve um, lie on, on the lattice Z squared. So you, you're trying to find lattice points on a curve which is a very classical problem. Um, all right, so we, we need to know something about this function f in order to, to, to count this. Okay, for example, if f was linear, then maybe you could get a lot of solutions because you, you there's a lot of lattice points that are collinear. But this function f is nonlinear. 
and in fact, it's convex. Uh, oh, hang on, we'll get to that later. Um, yeah, so it's actually fairly easy to understand what this function does um, from things like Stirling's formula. You, can, you just compute, um, or even just from elementary um, computation. For example, n choose m. Um, that's n times n minus one times up to n minus n plus one over n factorial. Uh, clearly, n choose m is upper bounded by n to the m over n factorial, and is bounded below by n minus m to the m over n factorial, just by expanding out what n choose m means. And if you rearrange this, uh, you can actually solve, you can get a pretty good bound for uh, ft of m. This function is, is actually um, basically the mth root of t n factorial uh, plus a small error. Um, and in fact, you can get a, if you use Stirling's formula, you can get a, a quite precise asymptotic for this, this function. So we understand pretty well what this function does. Um, when m is very small, it actually grows quite fast. Um, but when m is big, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's quite well behaved. Um, and you can keep using Stirling's formula and differentiate it a few times. Um, and you could end up um, um, controlling bounds for f and its derivatives. Uh, so for example, you can show that f grows like um, m to the mth root of t. Uh, and then f prime, there's a certain asymptotic for f prime. Um, and there's a certain asymptotic for f prime prime. Uh, but in particular, uh, the second derivative turns out to be positive. Okay, so uh, this function actually is convex. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to find lattice points on a convex curve. Um, now, you can actually control um, not just the first two, two derivatives. In fact, all derivatives, you, you, there are good formulas for them. Um, this was done by Kane. Uh, it turns out that ft actually has, it's not just analytic, it actually continues holomorphically to a sector. And then you play with the Cauchy integral formula and you can get actually asymptotics for all derivatives of ft. Uh, they get a bit more complicated, but they look a bit like this. Okay, um, so why does convexity help? Um, so at least locally, uh, convex curves, uh, uh, it's hard for them to have too many lattice points. Okay, so suppose you have some convex, um, a, a graph of a convex function and the function has second derivatives positive, so it's convex, but, but not too positive. Suppose there's, there's some bound upper bound on, on, on this curve. So you, you have some, some convex curve like this. Now, if you have three solutions, three lattice point solutions to um, um, three lattice points on this graph. So uh, M1, F of M1 and so forth. Okay, so uh, because this curve is convex, um, these three points are not collinear. And so if you take the triangle spanned by these three lattice points, the area is non-zero. But on the other hand, it's not too convex. There's some upper bound on, um, um, on the second derivative. So there's also some upper bound on this area. It turns out to be 1 16th, one sixteenth times this upper bound times, uh, if all these, if all these um, um, solutions lie in some interval i, it turns out to be, to, to be uh, i squared times a certain constant. Okay, so there's some lower bound on the area of this triangle. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have Pick's theorem, a, a classical theorem in, in geometry that says that uh, if you take three lattice points, uh, the area between the three lattice points, it's half the wedge product. So it has to be half an integer. Uh, the, the area by any, spanned by any three lattice points is half an integer. In particular, it can't lie between zero and one half. Um, so as long as this upper bound, once, once this upper bound is less than one half, um, these two facts are contradictory and you can't actually have three solutions, uh, three lattice points on this curve. So basically uh, what this says is that as, as long as your interval i, is, if, if, you have, if your convex curve is short enough that this quantity is less than a half, then you can only have at most two lattice points on, on, this, on, um, on this curve. So you get an up and bound of two on the number of solutions, integer solutions to your equation, as long as your, um, your interval is, is short enough. Okay, and we have upper bounds on the second deriv derivative, so you can, you can use this and you, you calculate and what you find eventually after a little bit of calculation um, is that um, uh, if you want to count, if you wanted to count solutions to uh, this equation, n choose m equals t um, uh, in the left half of Pascal's triangle, um, as long as you are interested only in solutions that are close, okay, so that, that if, if you have um, solutions that are, so, Remember m and m prime, they're size about log t. Um, if if, if uh, m is close to m prime and n is close to n prime, um, if, if they're much closer than log t, here we have exponential of log log t to one minus epsilon. So that's a quantity that, that is substantially smaller than log t. 
So if you have two solutions that are close to each other, then there's no third solution. There's, there's, there's at most one other solution uh, close to any given solution, right, basically because of, of this convexity argument. So what the Archimedean analysis tells you is that if, um, uh, if you can get all the solutions close to each other, sufficiently close to each other, then you can only then there's, you only have two solutions. There's there's there's, there's no um, at most, um, okay. So um, so the only remaining task to do is to try to figure out why solutions uh, why why collisions to um, uh, on this equation have to be close to each other. Okay, so that's that that's what you can do using uh, this Archimedean approach. Okay, so to actually get solutions close to each other, we need. Uh, um, the complementary non-Archimedean approach. Um, and what it will give us, as it turns out, what we're able to show is that if you do have two solutions to this equation, if n choose m and n prime choose n prime are close to each other, um, so I collide, um, and they're in the left half of Pascal's triangle, then m and n prime have to be quite close. Um, they have to be within this quantity, exponential log the two thirds of n, which is a quantity much smaller than n. For example, it's less than n to the epsilon for any epsilon. Um, so M and M prime have to be close. Um, and furthermore, as long as you avoid the degenerate case where M, what, M or M prime is really, really small, um, also N and M prime have to be close as well. So, um, right, so we have, um, yeah, we, we have this, uh, um, we actually get the closest that we need. Two, two thirds is less than one. So uh, this is actually um, um, good enough for the complementary Kane analysis to work. Uh, right, so we have this distance estimate that any two solutions to um, any two collisions have to be close to each other. Okay, so we, you combine this estimate with the previous Archimedean estimate, and that's how we prove our main theorem. Okay, so really that the, the hard step is actually proving this distance estimate. Why should it be that um, whenever two binomial coefficients are close, why should that mean that, that M and M prime are close and N and M prime are close? And to justify that, we need the, um, this non-Archimedean approach. Okay, so that's based on understanding how the primes divide n choose m. Okay, so um, so just to motivate how we do this, here's a simple uh, uh, observation. Okay, so here's here's what the binomial coefficient n choose m looks like. It's the product of m numbers um, and m consecutive numbers n n minus one down to n minus n minus one plus one on the numerator and also m consecutive numbers on the denominator. Okay. So here's a classical fact. Um, if you um, take this binomial coefficient, this coefficient will be divisible by all the primes between n minus n plus one and n. So you've got, um, you've got numbers from one to n, okay, and then n minus n plus one. So you're multiplying together all the numbers um, in this interval and dividing out by all the numbers in this interval. So if you take a prime, which happens to be in this interval, um, such a prime will divide something in the numerator, but it won't divide anything in the denominator. So, um, so any prime in this interval will divide um, this binomial coefficient. Uh, on the other hand, any prime um, to the right of, of, um, of n won't divide this binomial coefficient at all, because if p is bigger than n, then it won't divide anything in the, in the numerator uh, or in the denominator. So the, uh, the, the, um, they won't divide this, this coefficient. So if you look at the primes that divide this binomial coefficient, you see a transition, okay? It, it is, you're divisible by all the primes in this interval, and then none of the primes um, pass this n, okay? So this number n, um, the numerator of this binomial coefficient um, delineates a threshold um, in the prime divisibility of uh, this binomial coefficient. So uh, you, could, you, you could try to use this threshold to, um, um, to, um, uh, to analyze collisions. See, if you now have, um, yeah, so, so in particular, uh, one thing this tells you is that uh, if this interval contains, um, um, if this interval contains a prime, then the largest prime in this interval is also the largest prime factor of, of, of n choose m. Okay, so, so as long as this interval contains primes, um, the, um, this, um, the largest prime in this interval has to, be equal to the largest prime in um, dividing n choose m. So in particular, if you have a collision between two such binomial coefficients, 
and they, they both, these intervals both contain primes, then the largest prime in this interval has to equal the largest prime in this interval. And that will force n and n prime to be quite close to each other. Okay, so um, if you know theorems about primes in short intervals, you can already um, start making some progress. Okay, so um, this was observed um, quite early on. Um, yeah, so for instance, um, one of the best, uh, the, the best theorem currently known about um, uh, primes and short intervals is that um, any um, any interval from x of uh, x minus x to the 0.525 um, contains a prime, as long as x is large enough. Um, and what this tells you, if you work it out, is that if you have a collision where m and m, m and m prime, this is a typo, sorry, uh, m and m prime are not too small, uh, if they're bigger than a certain power of n or n prime, then m and m prime are, are kind of close. They're within um, um, 0.525, uh, a polynomial factor of, of each other. Um, now, this isn't quite good enough. Um, what we actually need is uh, something which, which uh, are bound like this, log of 2 thirds plus epsilon and plus n prime. Um, so this bound is, is not good enough. Uh, also, these lower bounds are not good enough. Um, so this simple argument doesn't actually um, give us what, what we want. Um, we could do a lot better if we had much better theorems about primes and short intervals. So in particular, um, if you assume what's called Kramer's conjecture, uh, then you, you can get much, much, much better. Um, but, um, okay, but this is about as far as you can get just from um, trying to work with, with primes in, this, in, the, in these short intervals because we don't understand primes and short intervals as well as we would like. Okay, so uh, we would like to deal with, uh, we would like to modify this argument, but working with primes in much longer intervals than, um, than these sort of short intervals um, in, um, that you saw. Okay, so here's a variant uh, that strategy that, that uh, you might want to apply. Okay, so we take the same binomial coefficient, okay, but now, um, okay, so we have n and m, and think of m as being much smaller than, than um, than M. Okay, so previously we were analyzing primes um, of, um, up in this interval, um, but now let's actually uh, look at primes near M. Okay, so for example, um, okay, take primes that are maybe between M and say 1.01 M. Okay, um, so this interval, well, technically is even shorter than the other interval, but, but this interval uh, we actually can find, we, we know this interval has primes in it um, because of the, the prime number theorem. Okay, so if you look at primes, um, let's look at a prime inside inside this interval here. Now, if you take a prime in this interval, then it's not gonna divide the denominator because um, that only involves numbers up to M. And it will probably divide the numerator because uh, we are um, the numerator contains M consecutive numbers um, and P is only a little bit bigger than M. So this is almost a complete set of residues mod P. So it is almost guaranteed to um, contain a multiple P. So, um, if P lies in, 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 in this interval, um, it is quite likely that N choose M should be divisible by, um, by P, okay? Um, conversely, if P is a little bit less than M, if you take a prime between say one minus epsilon M and M, then uh, P would, will divide the de de denominator once um, uh, because uh, uh, P will actually appear in, 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 is one of the factors. And it will um, um, divide the numerator at least once because now we have an overcomplete set of residues. We have slightly more than p residues, um, but it's not likely that it will divide it twice. Um, or okay, it could potentially be um, um, maybe p squared where will divide one of these factors. But but let's say if, if, if n is, is not too big, if n is less than say m squared, um, then p squared can't divide um, uh, this product. Um, but um, you you almost have uh, a complete set of residues again, plus just a, a, a few extra terms. So it's likely that P will only divide the numerator exactly once. And so the two factors of P should cancel. And so what you expect is that P is, is um, uh, primes that are slightly less than M are very unlikely to divide um, this binomial coefficient. So you should still expect a transition, okay? So um, that there are a few primes um, dividing. Um, so for primes a little bit less than M, they are unlikely to divide N to M. And for primes a little bit bigger than M, you are very likely to divide M choose M. So there's some sort of st statistical tradition, uh, transition in the prime divisibility. 
And so that should somehow pin down where M is. Uh, if you want to find out what, um, work out where M should be, you look at transitions between um, where the primes divide and choose M and where they don't divide and choose M. And that transition should be, should tell you where M is. Okay. So, um, okay. So, so this is the, this is the plan um, to try to use these sort of statistical uh, uh, transitions uh, in the prime divisibility um, to uh, try to, to um, pin down what NNM should be. Um, and you could try to play with other intervals as well. Okay. Um, so once you have that idea, you don't need to work with intervals primes near N or primes near M. You could try to play the same game for other intervals as well. Okay. So how, how do you actually make this rigorous? Um, so the starting point, first of all, is that there's a very classical formula for how many primes actually divide um, a binomial coefficient. Okay. So um, way back in the 19th century, um, I guess, um, Legendre uh, observed um, that there's a formula for how many primes divide n factorial. Uh, it's just the integer part of n choose p plus integer part of n choose p squared plus integer part of n, n choose p cubed and so forth. Um, that, that's easy. You just count how many times p divides one of the factors in one to n and how many times p squared divides the factors and so forth. Um, and then once you work out that p-valuation, then as a corollary, you can actually work out how many times p divides a binomial coefficient, and you get what's called Kummer's theorem. Um, not Kummer's most important theorem, but still, uh, it's still called Kummer's theorem. Um, that the um, the number of times p divides a binomial coefficient is just the sum of um, j from one to infinity of the integer part of n choose pj minus m choose pj minus n minus m choose pj. Um, but the integer part, you can also think of is x minus the fractional part. And so you can, you can also write this in terms of the, um, of the fractional part. Okay, so the number of times p divides n choose m is just the sum of all these quantities here. Um, this expression turns out to be either zero or one. Um, what we need to think about this is that you, are, um, you can expand out m and n minus m base p. And if you add them up, um, um, if, and you just, you just, you get n of course. Um, and and in, in the j, Coefficient. Sometimes you you will you will um, you will get a carry when you add, and and you will have to to carry a one over to the t plus first place. And sometimes you don't. Um, and this quantity turns out to be exactly one when there's a carry in the j place and a zero otherwise. So Kummer's theorem is that the number of times p divides n minus m is equal to the number of carries when you add m to n minus m base p. All right. So this is the um, this is a formula for this p valuation. Okay, so what that tells you, um, and of course, um, from the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, if you want two numbers to be two natural numbers to be equal, that's true if and only if all the p valuations agree. So, um, so what you conclude is that um, if you want two binomial coefficients to collide, um, that's the same as requiring um, this sum of fractional parts over p to um, um, to be equal to the sum of, of this other sum of fractional parts over p um, for every prime p. So, um, so this, this collision can be sort of viewed piatically as an equation that has to hold for all primes p. Okay, that basically n and m minus them, when you add them, they, they will have exactly this, they, they will have carries, the total number of carries they have base p is exactly the same as the total number of carries n, minus m, n prime minus n prime and n prime have. Uh, base p for every prime p. All right, um, and once you you see this equation, you can kind of explain all these other um, these previous arguments. So so these previous arguments that we um, uh, you know so for for specific primes p, um, you can you can actually start computing what this is. For example, if 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 if, if p is very big, if p is bigger than n, then um, um, n choose p, n over p um, for the j, the fractional part is just, um, uh, you can remove the fractional part. This is less than one. Um, in fact, all these quantities are less than one and you, you can remove these fractional parts and, and this sum just simplifies to zero. Um, okay, so, and that's why none of the primes bigger than n divide the binomial coefficient. Um, and you can argue similarly, you can explain why all the primes between uh, n minus uh, n minus n plus one and n divide the binomial coefficient and you can also explain um, this other phenomenon that that uh, very few primes between m and one plus epsilon m divide um, 
this might not be a coefficient, but 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 many many primes. Sorry, uh, most primes here will divide will divide the binomial coefficient, but very few primes, slightly less than n, m, uh, divide the coefficient. So you can explain all these properties uh, we've discussed earlier in terms uh, once you see this formula. But uh, maybe I'll skip this uh, uh, the details of that. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, Basically, we need to. So uh, maybe I'll just. So in order to proceed now, we have to understand the. Um, uh, so we're going to proceed statistically. We're going to study what this, these sums behave like for various um, uh, as p ranges through various intervals. So we're going to pick p randomly in an interval, and we just ask what is the distribution of these sort of sums. And this is a, a, a question which we can answer by basically. Um, uh, by existing methods in an analytic number theory. So if you pick now a random prime um, in some interval, example, p to 2p, now actually for technical reasons, we, we pick a slightly shorter interval than p to 2p, but never mind that. Um, so um, we can actually understand, so we're interested in things like, uh, we, take, we fix a large number n, and we take the fractional part of n, of n over p. Um, and you can ask, what, what is the behavior of um, this sort of fractional part? So if n is really, really large, um, then, um, so, so first of all, if n is really, really small, um, like if n is less than p, right, then, then this will not be equidistributed, then this will also be a very small number. But if, if n is a medium size, um, so for example, if n is much bigger than p, uh, but much less than, as it turns out, exponential of log the three halves p, so there's a certain range of n, as it turns out, for which these fractional parts are basically um, equidistributed in the unit interval, that they, they take, that they're, they're uniformly distributed in the unit interval. Um, and, um, um, and then furthermore, if you have two such n and n prime, um, then any two such fractional parts will be behave like independent um, random variables between zero and one, uh, unless um, there's an obvious reason why they, they shouldn't. Um, so one of which, for example, is if n and n prime are equal, um, but more generally, if n and n prime are, are commensurable, for example, if n prime is twice n, um, or maybe um, one half n, then there is um, a correlation between these two fractional parts. But um, unless you have this uh, commensurability, uh, usually these fractional parts will be independent. Okay, so there's some basic facts like this, uh, which you can prove as long as n is um, big, but not too big. Um, if n, if n is too big, then you, you don't get this anymore. For example, if n is the product of all the primes between p and 2p, then all these fractional parts will be zero. Okay, so what, once n is like exponentially large in, 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 in p, you can't have um, equidistribution, but there is a certain large range where you do have equidistribution. Um, and the reason for that, um, so those of you who know equidistribution theories, you know, the way you, you prove that something is equidistributed is usually through the, the vowel criteria, you study exponential sums, so if you want to justify this sort of um, statement, uh, pretty soon you, you find yourself um, um, staring at exponential sums like this. You're, you're summing like e to the two pi i n over p, or maybe e to the two pi m over p to j, or maybe some combination. Um, so you, you're saying some exponential sum over primes uh, in some interval. Um, and this turns out to be quite standard, in fact, um, we eventually just opened up Ivanish Kowalski um, and just used the, uh, the 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 estimates that were available in that textbook. Um, yeah, so so in particular, there's there's um, these very powerful estimates of Vinogradov, which give you good control on these exponential sums. You get some non-trivial cancellation, as long as n and m are not too big, as long as they're not bigger than this 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 quantity uh, exponential log the three halves p. So that's something that's um, it's quite a bit bigger than p. It's bigger than p to any power. So there's there's a nice big range. Of n and m for which uh, these exponential sums uh, we can basically compute, um, and so that's the range where we can we can do our work. And this, by the way, is why eventually we have this restriction um, that m can't be a, um, any has to be at least a log two thirds of n. It's it's because of the upper bound um, in the uh, range of applicability of the Vinogradov estimates. All right, um, so we. We have this equidistribution, and so um, the way you can use that is that, um, um, so for example, what this tells you is that once n and m, n minus m and m are, are big enough, 
um, these quantities are, are equally distributed. And so you can start computing moments. Um, so for example, if you want to com uh, compute the first moment expectation of a quantity like this, as long as n and n minus m and, and m are all big enough, um, um, these quantities are equally distributed between zero and one. So their, their mean is, is one half roughly. And so this expression, this, um, the sum would therefore also have mean one half plus one half minus one half, which is one half. So um, on the average, every um, uh, the, the jth place base p should to experience half a carry on the average. Okay, so so we, we can take the expectation of um, of this quantity, and it will be one half if m and n are all that all large enough. Um, if if they're not all large enough, for example, if if um, if p is uh, drawn from say this interval here. Then, um, right, so if, if P is just a little bit less than, than M, then M choose P is actually just a little bit bigger than one. And so then suddenly this expectation is um, close to zero. So um, in this range, you get zero plus one half minus a half. So if you, if you restrict a prime P to an interval like this, the expectation drops from one half down to zero. Um, and so this is how you can start seeing this statistical phase transition. Um, between um, um, uh, between the number of times that a prime divides your binomial coefficient. So um, right, so you can start computing moment um, first moments of this quantity, and so you can you can start showing it. And certain that if n and m are sufficiently different from n prime and m prime, then for certain intervals for p in certain intervals, the expectation of the uh, so you can, what you can do is that you can you can go back to this formula here. You can take expectations of both sides. Okay, and then, of course, we have the magic of linearity expectations. We can move the expectation inside the sum. And the point is that if n and n prime are different, and m and n prime are different um, enough, then you can find some range of primes where there is a visible difference between the expected number the expectation of one of these summands and the expectation of the other summand. And so you, you can start um, getting a, a contradiction. And so you can, you can start showing that collisions do not occur if, if these numbers are far enough apart. So th that is the strategy. Um, so you can start, you can work that out and um, Yeah. So um, yeah. So you can get quite far with the, this first moment method, and you, you can actually show, um, for instance, uh, if if m and n prime are very big, like if they're bigger than say epsilon n or m, m, epsilon n prime. So if you're working really in the um, middle region of uh, Pascal's triangle, then um, this argument I just gave you is good enough. It actually gives you um, pretty much the whole theorem um, just from coming first moments. Um, but it, it stops working very well when m is really small. Like if m is less, uh, once m is less than say root n, um, the problem is that actually um, um, there are many terms here, j equals one, j equals two, j equals three and so forth. And the higher j terms actually start causing trouble. Uh, so you need to somehow get rid of these, um, uh, the higher order contributions, uh, j equals two, j equals three and so forth. Um, and so the trick we, we use to, to deal with that case is uh, we use the second moment method. So uh, instead, of, instead of computing means, um, eventually uh, what we found was the best thing to do was to actually take uh, covariances. So, um, right, so given any two random variables, x and y, there's a quantity called the covariance, um, which is basically a normalized inner product of x and y. Um, and so what you can do is that, uh, oops, you can, uh, if you believe these random variables are equal, you can you can take um, you can take the, co the you take the covariance of this with uh, some other random variable, and it turns out that the random variable that we, we picked was if you pick some other number n. Uh, if if this random variable is equal, then um, you take covariances. Then for, for any number n, um, the, the covariance of this sum with um, this random variable must equal the covariance of this sum with the same random variable. Um, and the reason why this is a good thing to do is that it turns out that, that for j not equal to two, for j, for j bigger than two, um, these random variables turn out to be, be basically independent of any random variable that looks like this. And so by taking covariances, you can actually eliminate all the, um, um, uh, all the terms in the sum other, um, 
uh, other than um, the, uh, the, the first term. So you, you can get rid of all the, um, the prime powers uh, by taking this covariance. It's kind of like a orthogonal projection sort of to, uh, to just sort of the j equals one terms. So, um, so because of this um, independence between fractional parts of n over p and fractional parts of n over p squared and so forth, um, what you can do um, Right, so uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you do that, well, uh, um, you end up with this, um, a certain simple equation. So the, um, the only uh, terms that are left are contributions of j equals one. And so if you define this uh, quantity, which you call C1 of mn to be the covariance between m over p and n over p. So these are certain numbers for every n and m. Um, you get a certain equation, approximate equation relating um, a combination of three covariances to a combination of three other covariances. Um, and this is an equation that you can actually just solve uh, because it turns out that we can compute uh, these covariances. Um, so uh, usually they're zero. Uh, if M and N are completely unrelated to each other, there should there be no there should be no relationship between the, the fractional part of M choose N, uh, M over P and N over P. Um, but occasionally they, they do um, correlate. So there is actually, uh, you can actually compute just with, from Fourier analysis. Um, if n and m um, are commensurable, that they that they have um, um, that the ratio is basically uh, a over b for some uh, rational number a over b, then the the covariance is actually um, approximately one twelfth over a b. So, for example, if 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 if, uh, if m, for example, is two thirds of n, um, so then um, I guess a is um, a is two and b is three. Uh, so in, in that case, the covariance between n, then m over p and n over p are, are correlated. And the covariance turns out to be uh, one over 12 times two times three, which is uh, whatever is 96, I guess. Okay, so, so when two numbers are commensurable, then there's a certain covariance, but uh, the less commensurable they are, the smaller the covariance gets. And if you're not commensurable at all, then the, the covariance is basically zero. Okay, so um, this, this covariance structure actually uh, has shown up in the literature before. Um, there was actually um, a closely related problem of um, studying what are called uh, integer factorial ratios. Okay, so um, you all know that binomial coefficients have to be integers, of course. Okay, but it turns out that there's a few other ratios of factorials that are also integers. Um, so for example, Chebyshev's ratio, uh, this particular ratio of, of binomial coefficients turns out to always be an integer. Um, this is how Chebyshev proved Chebyshev's theorem uh, bounding the number of primes um, in an interval, actually. Um, so it's sort of a precursor of the prime number theorem. Um, and uh, you can classify to a large extent which uh, ratios are integer factorial ratios. And um, in doing so, uh, this, this same covariance structure shows up. So anyway, basically, once you have this formula, um, what's left to do is, is uh, to just classify all the solutions to um, yeah, so, so basically uh, uh, what you end up having to do is you have to just find how many, um, you have to solve this equation. So you, you, you plug in various values of, of capital N, like, like little n, little n prime and so forth. And you start solving this equation and um, using this, 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 uh, this formula, what you find after a certain amount of tedious case analysis is that um, you, you, uh, you can't have uh, these covariances equal to each other unless M is really close to N prime and N is really close to N prime. Um, so there's a certain amount of tedious case analysis, which gives you this distance um, estimate. And then um, once you combine that with this Archimedean estimate, that's how we get our main theorem. Okay, I am done. I think that's my last slide. So thank you very much. <laughs>